Does JP have a copy of the liturgy for the pastors? Oh, that's on PJ. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Creation Fellowship. It's good to see all of you on this Lord's Day. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my great joy and privilege in leading us in our time of worship. We especially want to welcome those of you who may be visiting us for the first time. I see some new faces. Welcome again. Thank you for joining us. Is my mic working? Hello? There we go. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, but we just want to welcome all of you on this Lord's Day as we worship our great God together. And if you're here investigating Christianity, thank you so much for coming to a place that may be a little bit familiar to you. We hope and pray that our time together, as weird and as odd as it may be, may it in some ways give you some informative understanding of what we Christians believe as we gather every Sunday that we call the Lord here. One of the things that we do as we begin our worship service is that we always spend a few moments of just preparing ourselves to worship our great God. The Bible teaches us that God is the glorious creator of heaven and earth who had no beginning and will have no end. And surely a stature of such a person is someone to whom we should always be mindful of before we dare approach him. And so one of the things that we do before we just jump right off into singing praises to him is we spend a few moments of just preparing our hearts to be in his presence. So I invite you right now just to settle down and to uh, get situated and whatever distracting or discouraging thoughts or circumstances that may be weighing on your heart right now, that you would just surrender it and go to your God. So I invite you now just to spend a few moments of preparing yourselves to worship our great God. Let's prepare together. And now, dear friends, I invite you to please stand with me for our great God summons us to worship him. Hear now the call to worship from Psalm 66. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praises be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Let's sing hallelujah.
Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the
scribe and tongue lift your voice as one he is greatly to be praised sing to the Lord all my soul let the
Father, that is what we declare on this glorious morning that you and your beloved Son and the wonderful, delightful Holy Spirit is our great and awesome God. We have gathered here because we have been summoned by you again to come and to give you all the glory and honor that is rightfully yours because we, your people, have created for that very purpose. And so, our great God, we ask that you would receive us because you have made us into the glorious image of your Son, because of the great work he has done on our behalf as our Savior, as our King, as our great Redeemer, as the wonderful Bridegroom who has come for his bride to make her presentable and pleasing to you. God, we ask that as we have come, that you would cause us to surrender ourselves to you as our great King, for, Father, we have tasted and we have been disgusted with the ways in which we have suffered because we have tried to rule over ourselves and to be our own kings, to be our own queens, to be our own God. And we no longer want to rule our own lives because we have seen and tasted the bitterness and the sorrow that comes. For we know that we are not able to lead ourselves. We need you to be our guiding light, to be our enduring hope, to be our strength, to be our hope, to be our peace. And so, God, would you now bless your people as we have come together to worship you in spirit and in truth, so that no matter what we have been going through, no matter the circumstances that we are in, we can come to this place reminded of who we are, the destiny that is awaiting for us, and the purpose and mission that you have given to us to live out into this broken world. Father, we pray that you would indeed fulfill the promise that you have made in your word, that when two or more are gathered under the banner of the name of your Son, there your healing and wonderful presence would be amongst us. And so, God, be present and be our healer, be our strength, be our hope, so that we can go back out into the world as your faithful ambassadors. But, Lord, until then, bless us now as we've come here to worship you. Strengthen our resolve and give us peace within so that we can express hope without. Oh God, hear us and be with us now, for we ask all these things in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus and all God's people together said, amen and amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to NCF. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my joy and privilege to lead us in a time of worship together. We especially want to welcome those of you who are visiting us as our guests. Thank you for accepting the invitation of a friend, a coworker, or a sibling that uh, calls NCF their home. Or if you just happen to find us on the internet, as we so often do, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're now at the portion of our service where we do something known as the corporate confession of sin. If this is your first time attending a church, let me just give you a quick uh, synopsis of what we're about to do. One of the things that we Christians believe is that when we come together, not only do we sing our praises to God, not only do we hear his word, but we also come to him with honesty. You know, so often in the social media age, we're so used to just portraying ourselves in the best possible light, which in many instances is an artificial light through filters and through projections and angles, we so often present ourselves in a way that is not honest. It's not sincere and it's not integrious. But one of the things that God invites us to do when we worship is to just freely be ourselves where we can openly acknowledge things in our lives that we wish weren't true. And yet because of our selfishness, because of our sins, they are very much true. But here's where the good news of the gospel comes in. The Bible says that everything about yourself that is true, that you don't want to be true, don't have to be true anymore. Because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, he has brought redemption and transformation so that the person that we instinctively long to be can be a genuine possibility without the artificial filters of man-made technology. We can go to God and become the person we desire to be through the miraculous supernatural work of Jesus' death on the cross. So if you find yourself this morning really struggling with discouragement and depression, frustration at yourself because you are not that person that you know you should be, here's where you can go to God now and confess whatever sins that's haunting you and lay them at his feet so that you can hear the response of our God of not only of his promise to forgive you, but his assurance to change you to become more like his beloved son Jesus, the person that we all long to be. And so let's prepare our hearts now and let's go to God confessing whatever personal sins God is calling you to do. And to do that, let's first prepare ourselves by publicly confessing our sins through the scriptures, which comes to us today from Micah chapter 7, 
verses 1 to 4. Please read the scripture out loud where it says people, and then I will read the portion where it says minister, and may the Spirit use his holy word to convict you of any personal sins he's calling you to repent of this morning. Please follow along with me. What misery is mine. I am like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the earthly figs that I crave. The faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright worse than a thorn hedge. The day God visits you has come. The day your watchman sounds the alarm. Now is the time of your confusion. Let's go to him now in a time of personal silent confession. And now, my dear friends, I invite you to please stand with me and hear God's response to our heartfelt confession that comes from Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Hear now the response of our God in his holy word. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from our present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In Christ, we are fully forgiven and pardoned. Let's give him praise. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. in his blood perfect submission all is at rest I am my savior and happy and blessed watching
be seated. We're now at the portion of our service where we do the corporate confession of faith. And the purpose of this confession, this public confession, is to showcase what it is that binds us together as a church, not only as a local congregation, but as part of God's universal church that transcends space and time. We are not just a church within a corner of Queens, New York City. We are part of God's historical global church. And the thing that binds us together is the confession that we hold to as the truth and therefore binds us beyond our culture, beyond our race, beyond our national creed. We come together because of the universal truths that God has given to us in his holy word. For this reason, we are going through this year a confession of faith known as the Westminster Shorter Catechism, a question answer format that teaches us about what we Christians believe is foundational to our Christian faith. Today we're going over questions 13 to 15. I will read the questions out loud and together in one voice. Let's recite the answers together. Question, did our first parents, Adam and Eve, continue in the state in which they were created? Our first parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the state in which they were created by sinning against God. Question, what is sin? Sin is any lack of or transgression of the law of God. Question, what was the sin by which our first parents fell from the state in which they were created? The sin by which our first parents fell from the state in which they were created was their eating the forbidden fruit. Amen. All right, at this time, I'm going to ask all of our teacher volunteers to please stand and go to the back. Everyone else, please stay where you are. If we could have all of our teachers and teaching assistants to stand up and make your way to the back so you are prepared to 
take our beautiful children. And to the rest of our children going to Sunday school, would you please stand up so Pastor John can pray for you right where you are, and then we will dismiss you. You guys all know what we need to do. We are to follow the teacher that has the same color flag that matches your uh, name tag color. So they're all situated. So let me pray for you guys. And then Pastor John's going to dismiss you, okay? Let's put our hands together and close our eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for our beautiful children that you have blessed this congregation with. Lord, an abundance of the next generation that is a visual reminder of our duty to you that is translated to them, of making sure that we teach and raise them right in the ways of the gospel. Father, grant us wisdom so that we would do our part in creating the next generation of believers who will continue on the work that we are doing now, which is to be a living witness to a world that desperately needs to hear and see the gospel being lived out in the lives of believers. Father, we pray that our teachers and assistants will faithfully execute their duties, this holy privilege of being able to raise the next generation, sharpening their minds and their hearts of being directed towards you in a devotion to you that will bless this world. Father, we pray that you will raise our children in such a way that we would be honored to see them grow before our very eyes and become even more faithful, more obedient, more greater in the eyes of the kingdom than even their parents' generation. Oh God, hear this prayer and answer it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone, you're dismissed. Please make your way up. Please try not to run. And folks, while our children are making their way to Sunday school, could we be so kind in standing and greeting one another? And the Lord, let's pass the peace of Christ to each other. What fortune lies beyond the stars, those dazzling hearts too fast to climb. I got so hard to fall so far, but I found heaven as love swept. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Here now the reading of God's word. Come now, you rich, weep, and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for being our God, and we thank you for loving us and for guiding us and for all that you do for us, taking care of all of our various needs, O oh Lord. <laughs> Lord, as we humbly come before you to worship you this day, may you be ever pleasing to your sight, O oh Lord. <clears throat> may we be refilled with your spirit and renewed for the week ahead, O oh Lord. And I pray, God, that you'll use me to speak your words of truth to your people today. Thank you. In your son, Christ, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I don't know how many of you guys remember, but uh, when we were younger, 
there used to be this book series called Choose Your Own Adventure, right? And basically, each book would be an adventure story, maybe a knight's tale, or a space adventure, or a pirate adventure. And after you read the first few pages, you are prompted to make a decision. And depending on the choice, it tells you to turn to that appointed page in the book, and you continue your adventure from that point on. And you keep doing this until you get to the end of the story, right? If we were to pretend we had this type of control and outcome of our lives here, what would we choose? So I want to try a little experiment. Now we don't have to go too back into our past, but we need to stay relative to our youth. So we'll stay at that age, maybe our high school age, okay? And we're doing a, a choose your own adventure, all right? You are in your senior year in high school. You just finished another wonderful day at school. You had a great time with your friends. You had an awesome uh, volleyball team practice, but you're feeling a little nervous because today is a day that college acceptance letters come out, or maybe in this day and age, college emails come out, right? You get to your house, you walk in, and your parents are already waiting for you with the laptop set up and the website loaded. You log in and you check and choose your own adventure. You get into your first choice school with the cho your major of your choice, and also you get to room with your best friend, or you, re get, you get rejected from your school, your heart was set on going, and you had to settle for insert name of school that you don't want to go to. Which would you choose? And I'm pretty sure all of us would choose school of our choice. So great, now you are in. You go to school, you enjoy your four, inter four years at university of first choice. Your professor takes a liking to you and recommended you to his friend who works at the firm or the company that you would like to get into. And the professor says, all you have to do is go and pass your interview, and you are in. All right? Choose your own adventure. You age your interview. You're serious when needed, but you make jokes as well to show your humor. Or the subway gets delayed, and you miss your interview. What would you choose? And once again, I'm pre pretty sure you choose. You ace your interview. So you get your job. And the salary is amazing, you're making strides at work, and one night you're out with your friends out in the town, and off in the distance of the restaurant where you're having dinner, you see the man or woman of your dreams, they look good, you feel like you look good. Choose your own adventure. You go and you strike up a conversation with them, which will eventually lead to a long, happy relationship and wonderful marriage, or you kind of still want to explore this bachelor life. Let's say marriage it is, and all those jokes of losing freedom during marriage was way off. You love the married life, and you love having your two choose your own adventure. Kids are who are obedient and a delight, or kids who make your life a living hell. Let's take obedient kids. You keep getting promoted, raises every year, work and life, and everything is great. Choose your own adventure. Continue on this road. Build a robust portfolio, own real estate properties, live in luxury, carefree, being able to do whatever you want and buy whatever you want, or you realize your fund manager was a scam artist and they steal everything from you, you lose everything and you go to the slums. Doesn't seem like too hard of a choice, right? Now, I didn't ask you guys, you guys to raise your hands during this time, but I'm pretty sure, if I had to guess, I think most of us made the same choices in this little experiment of mine. We all went to the college of our choice. We did well. We aced our interview. We got the job we wanted to get. We got married to the person of our dreams. We, got, we raised good kids. We lived with plenty, without stress and worry, and we lived in luxury. And we chose this life even after hearing the verses read for today. Even though the very first verse we read in James 5, chapter 1 reads, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. We thought, hey, the choices seemed good. We heard that and still thought, I'm not really sure what that means, but if I can choose comfort, luxury, decadence, and abundance, and wealth, let me choose that. Maybe some of you felt uncomfortable choosing that way, like, okay, PC, uh, what's the catch? 
Perhaps you're waiting for me to end the adventure differently. And when we see passages like these in the Bible, and we, passages like the ones we read today that deal with wealth and money, abundance and comforts, we do at times get uncomfortable, right? Because for us, we hope or we think, can we have both? As a Christian, can we have both? As a maturing Christian then, what do you think the answer is? Can you be a rich Christian? When we look, <clears throat> excuse me, when we look at this exhortation that James gives, we see that it's not money itself or being rich itself that is being looked down upon. Having money in and of itself is not a sin. What then is the issue that is being addressed to the rich landowners during James's time and is being given to us today? You know, James speaks about the rich and poor many times in his letter. We see it in chapter 1 when he says the rich will be humiliated and fade away. We see it again in chapter 2 when he says, don't show partiality to the rich, but treat everyone the same. We see it in chapter 4 about the rich who boast about what they will do that year and how they will make money. It may seem that James has an agenda against the rich, perhaps a bias against rich people. So what is the issue? Sam Elberry, a pastor and author, says that for James... It is not wealth that is the issue, but rather what is done and not done with that wealth. What Alberry is saying is money is the problem. Making a lot of money is not the problem. It is how people gain that money, use that money, what they do with that money that becomes the problem. Making money is not a sin. If it was, that would mean all of us in here who work are sinning just by working and getting paid. It's when we start making money and how we treat it or use it to treat others that can be the problem. James shares and starts off his passage. He's using language very similar to prophets of old. Turn with me again to James 5.1, which says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. The prophets in the Old Testament used this type of language when they spoke about judgment. Isaiah 13, 6, the prophet Isaiah says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Hosea, Amos, Jeremiah, and others all use this cry out to God words and tells people to cry out because the day of judgment is coming near. James uses that same type of language to his, re to his readers. Weep and howl because miseries are coming upon you. Perhaps not in this lifetime, but maybe in the final judgment. The rich has committed various sins with their money. They hoarded it to abundance. They lived in lavishness and they were unjust. Once again, being rich is not the sin. It is what and how the money was used or not used. Verses 2 and 3 says, your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are, have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Corrosion of metals take time, a very long time. So when James says your gold and silver corroded, it means that it has been, not been touched and has not been used for a very long time. It's just sitting there. Their garments are moth-eaten, meaning they have a lot of clothes, they just don't wear it. It's sitting around for moths to get to and to eat. These rich people have an abundance. These signs are evidence that the money, the blessings given to this rich, this, these rich people have not been used properly, which is to help God's people. There's a TV cartoon that I used to watch growing up. Many of you may have watched it too, called DuckTales. The show is primarily about the adventures of a wealthy duck and his three nephews. The wealthy duck's name is? So everyone knows. Scrooge McDuck. And he's often seen going into his vault and swimming in his multitude of golden coins. And he doesn't share his wealth. His name Scrooge means selfish, unfriendly, unwilling to give away money. So his name is unwilling to give away money duck. 
I read an article, a real article, that said that the character Scrooge is the worst rich character in media. And the reason was because he does nothing with his money. It just sits there. He doesn't invest it into the economy or make advancements to society. He just stores it in a huge vault and occasionally pulls on an old-time swimsuit outfit and jumps in and swims. Regarding wealth, the great theologian John Calvin said, God has not appointed gold for rust, nor garments for moths, but on the contrary, he has designed them as aids and helps to human life. The sin, the judgment to come was not because these people were making lots and lots of money. It was because they were hoarding it and not using it to help their neighbors and help those around them in need. Those of us who are Christian and have been blessed abundantly are asked to share with those who have less. And we see this play out in the formation of the early church where they sold things they had extra of to give to those in need. Verse 4 talks about the next sin. It says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your field, which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Injustice. The wealthy landowners had people work their fields, but they didn't pay them. Or perhaps they didn't pay them at a proper time or quickly enough that they suffered. And this is a big no-no in the Bible, even in the Old Testament. You know, when God gave Moses the many laws recorded, this was recorded in Deuteronomy 24, 14, 15. It says, You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Even to Israel, God gave this command. Do not hold on to the pay you are to give to those who work for you. Give it to them in a timely manner. They needed to live. They needed to survive. And if they cry out to God, God will answer for them. James gives the same warning to the readers of his time. If the laborers cry out against you, the cries will reach the ears of the Lord of hosts. The rich people were unjust <clears throat> to their workers, defrauding them, treating them poorly, because usually the rich have the power over the poor. And I know a person who's going through something very similar to this. They work in an office for hourly pay, and um, sometimes they don't get paid on payday. Sometimes it's a day late. They've told me that sometimes their pay has been a week late, and the boss just doesn't seem to care. They just say, oh, I, I'm busy. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you, but I'm busy right now. So one day, they, that person, the other people in the office confronted him. And I guess the boss told them, he'll do better. I'll do better. But once again, the next pay, pay cycle came, and they didn't get paid. Sometimes the hours that they worked is also not properly paid out for some reason. The boss makes miscalculations of a few hours. And when you hear this, you think, that sucks. That boss is a horrible boss, right? How can he do that to his worker, his workers? And it's even worse when you hear that that boss went to the office and showed off his $200,000 watch to his employees. I didn't even know they made $200,000 watches. What makes the matter even worse is the boss proclaims to be a Christian, and their father is a founding elder of a church, and they still act this way. The last I heard, after much, much confrontation, one of the workers eventually got fired for standing up for themselves, and they reached out to the remaining workers, telling them they hired a lawyer to track any lost past, past pay and to sue the boss for whatever they need to get. So that, that boss may get what's coming to him in the courts on earth, but also if they don't change their ways, the Bible says they might even face an even harsher, harsher punishment harsher judgment in front of the final judge. So the rich, with their money, they were unjust to those around them, those who worked for them. And finally, the sin of luxury, it seems to say. Verses 5 and 6. 
You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. When you think of a fattened animal, what do you think about? My mind always goes to the story of the prodigal son in the Bible, where when the son returns, the father says, bring out the fattened calf. Bring out the fattened cow and slaughter it for this feast because my son was lost, but now he has been found, right? Fattened implies it was purposely made fat, right? It wasn't bring out the fat cow, let's eat it. It was bring out the fattened cow, the one we gave extra feed to, the one that we made it so the skin will be, or not the skin, but the meat inside will be extra marbled and look nicer. Bring it out for we could enjoy this juicy meat, right? In America, there's a lot of turkey farms, and it gets busy year-round, but I heard it's busier around Thanksgiving because it's turkey season, right? And when you read up on these turkey farms, these turkeys live pretty decent lives, right? They're very well taken care of. The feed given to turkeys change 10 times throughout the, uh, their life cycle to meet its various nutritional needs. They have a nutritionist, someone who monitors their feed and creates recipes for each stage of their life. They have diets that include vitamins and probiotics. The farmer goes in to their living space and checks it out twice a day to make sure it's clean. There's a computer system that maintains the temperature. There's a backup computer system in case the main computer system fails. They have medicine ready in case the turkeys get sick, especially so it doesn't spread to the other turkeys. The famous uh, Butter, Butterball Company, right, the famous turkey company, uh, they have labs on the farms that does autopsies on turkeys that die to see what they need to change to maintain the health of these turkeys. And they live in large, spacious areas so they can roam. And you may think, that's crazy. Such lengths for turkeys. But for what? So they could be killed and fill our stomachs on the holidays. The fattened calf was killed. The fattened turkeys are killed. The fattened hearts of the rich, those who live in luxury and self-indulgence, James says, a day of slaughter awaits. They have condemned and murdered the righteous. And it says the righteous does not resist because vengeance will be the Lord's. God will avenge them. Brothers and sisters, what are we to do with this warning given to us by James? Where do you all stand on this money issue? You know, we grew up with parents who instilled certain values within us. We're lucky if they give us Christian values. But if you're like me, most of us grew up from immigrant parents. They moved to America. They would have said something like, we moved here for the American dream to give you an opportunity that I did not have. And mostly it came down to money. We left a poor country to come here so you can be not Christian, so you can be rich. I want you to be rich because I was not growing up. I grew up, for my parents, in war-torn Korea. I was one of seven siblings. I had to fight for my food. Not you. You get to live in America with crazy food portions and abundance. We grew up being taught, make a name for yourself, pull up your boots, work hard for your money. Our parents wanted us to be doctors and lawyers, and some of us did that, and perhaps that made us well off. And you may say, Pastor Charles, I'm not rich. You may not be. I don't know how much you guys make. But you can probably say you're better off than what your parents were, at least when you are their age. And because we have seen our parents struggle, we work hard and say, I don't want to be like that. Or maybe I don't want my kids to be like that. Maybe because your parents were poor, you grew up poor and said, I don't want my kids to grow up like that. We saw our parents scrape by, so we think I need to save and save and save for the future. I need to make more. I need to be more secure. 
We see the lavishness of the people living in movies and Instagram and say, I want that. I want to be able to fly to these nice places and visit these islands and enjoy life. Brothers and sisters, having money is not the problem. Making money is not the sin. But is that what is driving you each morning when you get up? I got to get paid. I got to make money. Paul writes in, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So where is your focus? The desire to be rich that may lead to temptation and destruction. The love of money, which is the root of evil. The desire made people wander away from the faith. They served money, found security in it, and left the only thing that could give us true security. The only thing we are to put our faith in, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus himself was of humble beginnings, the Son of God born not in a hospital, not in lavishness and pomp, but born in a manger. Not born into earthly royalty with servants at his beck and call, but born to a carpenter, a blue-collar worker, a man perhaps with rough hands because of his work. Our Savior said things on the Sermon on the Mount that his half-brother James is echoing here. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He was telling the crowd, choose. What will it be? Our Heavenly Father who is eternal, or money which will fade away. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him what he must do to inherit eternal life, Jesus ends by saying, sell everything that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And the man left weeping because he was rich. That's what the Bible says. The young ruler loved his possessions more than he loved Jesus. Jesus asks us to be willing to give everything up and follow him because he is the only one worth following. Jesus is our only treasure. We can let go of all other things because Jesus is better. God gave us a way to this treasure, that is Jesus, by having his son die and resurrect for us. When we follow after him, we follow him into salvation, into his glory. The good news then is not the new hot stock to invest in. It is not a new get-rich-quick scheme or a new side hustle. The real, only good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What our Heavenly Father did for us through His Son. It is possible to be poor now and rich in the world to come. Jesus is the one and the way that makes that happen as we seek after Him. When we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes within us. It gives us the power to change and to grow and to mature. God changes our hearts so we can be generous and share what we have. On our own, our sin may continue to make us pursue wealth and earthly gains and earthly treasures. But when the Holy Spirit comes within us, we set our eyes on something else. We seek to store up treasures in heaven. We get pierced with the knowledge of what Jesus did on the cross for us, and we turn to him knowing and remembering that all good things come from him alone. Safety and security come from God alone. Remember the advice Jesus gave his disciples and also gives us when he spoke to them about taking up the cross. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul. Matthew 16, 26. So I guess we go back to choose your own adventure. What will you choose to serve? Money or God? What will you choose? Gain the whole world or the salvation of your soul? Christian, as you mature in your faith, you will know how to treat what God 
has given you. You can be a rich Christian. Abraham was rich. Isaac was rich. Jacob, Joseph, David, Job, Cornelius was rich. Lydia, Aquila, Priscilla, and Philemon. They were all rich. But more than that, they were all God-fearing. Their faith was not in their wealth, but was in God and God alone. You too, brothers and sisters, can be rich, but where is your faith? Where is your security? Is it on your wealth? Is it on your pay? Or is it on Jesus Christ? How do you view the blessings God has given you? Do you just hoard it for yourself? Do you use it to treat those around you unjustly? Do you just use it for your own enjoyment and self-gratification? And perhaps when we think about it like that, we can see plainly that it's not the Christian way. As we mature in our faith, we put our faith in God and thank God for his daily provisions to us. And at times, if we are given more, we use it for his kingdom's glory, trusting that God will always remain faithful to us as he has promised. So brothers and sisters, mature in your Christian faith. Do not seek the world, love money, or desire to use it for your own gain, but seek first God and his kingdom and his righteousness. Be aligned with God. Have the gospel take deep root in your hearts so, you, that, so you'll continue to turn to God. Mature in your faith and remember the only true treasure that never perishes, that never corrodes, that never is moth-eaten is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And put your faith and belief in him. Let's pray together. Holy Father, Lord, <clears throat> we thank you so much for being our God. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings here you bestow upon us as a community, as members. Lord, I know that in our heart of hearts, all of us in here are very grateful for what you have provided for us. But for more so than these earthly treasures you have given us, we thank you once again for your son, Jesus, who died and resurrected to save us from our sin. That even sinners like us, when we turn to you, turn to him, can be saved and brought back into your kingdom. Oh Lord, as we continue to wrestle and grow in our faith, as we wrestle about how we interact with this world, help us to continue to work on our hearts, to turn more and more to you, to live more and more the life you have wanted and called us to live, oh Lord. We thank you. In your son's Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're we're having a time of offering as we always do. If you're a guest or newcomer or visitor, we do not ask you to give. But for those of you who call NCF your home church, we ask that you give your proper tithes and offerings to our Lord. We're now at the portion of our service where we give our intercessory prayers to God. You know, hearing a message like that is going to really metaphorically punch you in the stomach, and that's a good thing sometimes. And perhaps this message convicted you, as well as reminded you of some other things that may be going on in your life that you need to pray for. This is the time where you can raise your own voices to the Lord and lift up whatever burdens that are weighing you down. Or it could be a time for you to think and pray for someone that you deeply love who is going through a circumstance or situation that is just impacting them and maybe even you. Take this time to pray for that person as well. Or this could be the time for you to pray for someone that maybe you don't like and you don't want to even think about, let alone pray for. And yet your God may be calling upon you right now because you are his child and he's called you to be like him of loving your enemy and to pray for him 
Whatever is going on in your life right now or whatever is going on in the life of those around you, this is a time where you can lift up your voices and know that your Heavenly Father is eager to hear and He's ready to receive whatever cry of dependence that you have, that we all have. And then afterwards, as you lift up your prayer, uh, one of our saints will lead us in a time of intercessory prayer. So I invite you now to summon up whatever burden that you have and lay before the feet of Jesus. Please join me as we lift up our prayers to our God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. time to lift our voices in prayer. Many of the people here in this room are currently going through difficulties in their lives. Unemployment, financial difficulty, relational problems. So many things in this world afflict our heart, soul, and mind that makes us feel helpless, hopeless, and depressed. You know the struggles within us profoundly, and only through you can we find peace. Please provide your provision and ease our burdens, and may we find solutions that are pleasing to you. We pray NCF can be a sanctuary where fellow believers can pray for, encourage, and aid each other during distressing times. We pray for the physical and mental health of NCF. Heal us from deep within, from cell to cell, so we can recuperate and stand strong. You are the great physician, and we believe your healing hands cure our ailments. We thank you for the servant leaders of NCF. We pray they have an abundance of energy while doing church together. Give them wisdom and joy while maintaining a posture of humility. Thank you, God, for Pastor John, Pastor Charles, Pastor Eddie, and Pastor Will. Equip these men to serve and teach your people and protect them from the evil one. Renew their hearts daily through the Holy Spirit and preserve their whole being. Bless their marriage and family so they can devote the gifts you gave them to do church. We are thankful for those joining us as newcomers and visitors. We pray when they come to NCF, they can feel welcomed and spiritually moved. Let your presence be felt and heard in this place where lives can be changed, faith can be strengthened, marriage life can flourish, and children and adults can both learn the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. One of the things that we do every week is we also celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Why? Because it showcases for us the source of our true treasure. It is through the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is through the pathway of the cross that we have access to the greatest treasures ever, the treasures of heaven, the treasure who is also the very source of sacrifice himself. 
As Pastor Charles so eloquently put it, Jesus is our treasure. He is our delight. He is our portion forever and ever. Amen. If you're here today investigating Christianity, again, we're so honored to have you as our guest, and we thank you that you are joining us today. However, we would ask that you would not participate in participating in the Lord's Supper because to do so would be to claim a faith that you do not currently possess. But if and when the time comes for you to profess faith and you would be able to meet with me or Pastor Charles or Pastor Eddie, we will be honored to lead you towards faith and then invite you to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. To the rest of you, my brothers and sisters, I invite you to please stand with me and confess the faith that qualifies you to come to our Lord's table. People of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, And please be seated. And now, brothers and sisters, I pass on to you that which the Lord Jesus gave to the church on the night that he was betrayed. After giving thanks in his name, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat of it, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. In the same manner, after the meal, the Lord Jesus then took the cup and he said to them, This is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness and remissions of sin. Drink from it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Later on, the Lord's servant, the Apostle Paul, tells us every time we eat and drink from the Lord's table, we proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim he is our greatest treasure. Please pray with me. Father, as we come before you now, after receiving the elements of the table, we pray that just as our body is assimilating the nutrients of what we have just eaten, we pray that by your spirit, our faith would be strengthened. As our spirit is assimilating all the promises that are embedded in that faith, that you are our hope, you are our treasure, you are salvation, you are the one to whom we bring our ultimate hope in. And so, God, would you hear us as we celebrate you and give thanks because we have been given the greatest treasure of all, making us the richest of all. God, let us take delight in what we have received at your hand so that we can be generous to those around us in the way that we live, in the way that we think, in the way that we do our lives. Hear us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing our praises to our King.
give a clap offering to our great God together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Brothers and sisters, hold out your hand and receive the Lord's blessing. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you back here next week. Please remember, if you can clear up by 1245, we would appreciate it. Thank you. It's my time to go, but before I leave.